video is learning targets 10 through 12 in the ecology unit talking about energy and ecosystems. So here we're going to be looking at energy flow and this is how energy from the sun where all energy originate works its way through the ecosystem. Again, all energy on earth comes from the sun and it flows through ecosystems from the sun as it's used by organisms for metabolism, as it's used for homeostasis. Remember, homeostasis is just keeping up the normal processes of your body. And so only a portion of the energy from the sun is used by organisms. Most of it, or a lot of it, is lost as heat. And heat is a very disorganized form of energy. It can't be used by organisms. We, of course, we use heat to like get warm or whatever, but we can't use heat in the sense of it's usable energy. We need organized energy. Sunlight is very organized energy. And it can be used by plants, of course, and we've talked about this. It can be used by plants and, pro and photosynthesis to create food, but we're unable to do that. And so we need organisms that are able to produce food, and that's what producers are. Producers are organisms that produce food using sunlight. Uh, some organisms use energy that's bound up in chemicals to produce food. Let's see if I have a picture of that. Yep. And so, like deep sea vents where there's no this aphotic zone, there's no light, and so some of these organisms use certain chemicals, hydrogen sulfide, in order to make sugar. But it's still the same idea. They are producing food for their ecosystem. And this is not called photosynthesis then, because photo is light. This is called chemosynthesis. Close enough. All right. So chemosynthesis process of using chemicals to make food. Well, you have your producers. You have your photosynthesis. You have your chemosynthesis. Again, chemosynthesis, very small portion of what's going on in the earth, mostly photosynthesis. And then you have producers, our consumers. These are organisms that eat other organisms. Different kinds of consumers are herbivores like our, our friend the deer. It consumes and eats plants only, an herbivore. Carnivores, like this cheetah here playing games with the baby gazelle, uh, they eat only meat. They're carnivores. They don't eat plants. A cheetah sure might chew on grass to like help its stomach, but it's not eating it for food. It eats things like gazelles. And then there are omnivores. Omnivores are consumers that eat both meat and plants, like the raven, like bears, like us. And then there are detritivores. Detritivores consume and eat dead material. They begin the dec decomposition process. They're not decomposers. They just eat dead material. Decomposers on the other hand, like fungi and bacteria, these are organisms that break down organic material back into its basic components. They return those basic components to the ground so that they can be taken up again by the producers. Fungi, for example here, some mushrooms. Bacteria are also decomposers. And again, they prepare those basic, they compare those organic materials or prepare them back for reabsorption for other living things like plants. And so that brings us to this idea of a food chain. Well, food chains just show the single string of relationships in an ecosystem. A food chain just shows one simple, simple, uh, very simple string of relationships. And so you can see it here. The hawk eats the snake, the snake eats the mouse, the mouse eats the grasshopper, grasshopper eats the grass, mushrooms eat everything, and the sun 
gives energy to all of it. Very simple relationship, food chain. Here's a food chain in an aquatic ecosystem. Aquatic ecosystems, uh, very simple food chains. Basically, big fish eats the smaller fish, and smaller fish eats the smaller fish, and until you get down to these little plankton that are like little plants, and little plankton that are like little animals. So, real simple. Well, that brings us to food webs, and food web shows all the interactions in a given community. And these are actually better to help us understand what's going on in the community. All the different dependencies that are in an ecosystem, you can see them by looking at a community. If a single piece of this food web is removed, it can show how that will affect the community. For instance, we have insectivorous birds here that are eating the insects. Well, what happens if that insectivorous bird goes away. Well, all of the things that it eats are now going to increase in population, which in turn might have an effect on the things that they eat, might cause them to start to go away. And so those ecosystems can start to collapse with just the disappearing of one single piece of that food web. Here's an aquatic food web, again, mostly just fish eating other fish, not as exciting as terrestrial food webs, or at least in my opinion. Now, food webs are arranged in these trophic levels. Now, trophic level is just a fancy word for saying feeding levels or the different levels that, are, that they feed at. You have producers at the bottom. These are things like grass flowers, that sort of thing. And then you have your primary consumers. Sometimes you'll see it written with a one, a little zero, or a little little circle there to say for primary. The primary consumers, what do they eat? They eat the producers. Then you have secondary consumers. Well, secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. Then you have tertiary consumers. And the tertiary consumers eat the secondary consumers and probably some primary consumers as well. Well, then you have this concept of apex predators. And I don't have a, a picture for that, but an apex predator is one that is at the very top of the food web. It has no natural predators. And so a mountain lion or a coyote would be a good example of an apex predator. A bald eagle is an apex predator. It exists at the very top. It's still part of this trophic level, so don't don't divorce it from that. It may be a, a tertiary, or there's even, it can go up to four or five, uh, but it doesn't go a lot higher than that. And we're going to understand why here in just a second. Because these different trophic levels represent the flow of energy as it goes through the ecosystem. Energy is very abundant at the bottom of the ecosystem, at the producer level. Why? Because they're getting energy directly from the plants or directly from the sun. All that energy is fresh from the sun. It's very abundant. However, as the organisms, or as you go up the pyramid here, the amount of energy it's going to decrease. Organisms only receive about 10% of the energy from the previous level. And why is that? Well, grass, let's say that, let's put a, let's put a number on it. Let's see if I've got one. No. All right. So let's, let's say that grass receives a thousand joules. Joules is just a an energy unit of energy from the sun. Well, grass is going to spend 900 of that on homeostasis. Remember homeostasis? Just the normal life functions, right? It's going to spend 90% of that on homeostasis. It's going to spend some of it on, it's going to use some of it as waste. 
it's going to also lose a lot of it as heat. And so then only 100 joules of that energy, 10% is left over for the next traffic level. We call this the rule of 10%. Whereas there's only 10% of energy available from the previous trophic level. Each one loses 90%. And so the mice, or the grasshopper, is homeostasis, has waste, uses a lot as heat. And so what's available for the snakes and the shrews at the next level? 10 joules. Well, homeostasis, waste, growing, all this different stuff that's going on. And so only one joule available of that original thousand from the plants is available for the, the owls at the top. And so you can represent this with a pyramid. The pyramid shows the, the bottom really wide, the top really small. And so we have several different pyramids that help us understand ecosystems. And this first one is this energy pyramid, just like we just showed. Producers at the bottom have the most energy, the primary consumers the second most, and as you go up, you're going to continue to lose more and more energy. And so this is why you can see if this ecosystem can't have a lot of levels, because if it has too many levels, there's a whole lot less energy left over at the top of the ecosystem. Another type of pyramid is called the biomass pyramid. And this shows the distribution of biomass from top to bottom of the food chain. Biomass is the dry mass of an organism. Meaning that if you took all the water out, this is what's left over. Well, where would we expect the most biomass in an ecosystem? At the very bottom with the producers, lots of mass. Well, this ecosystem is going to have a lot less mass of the primary consumer, and then even less of the secondary. And then this whole ecosystem might only have, where you have this whole forest and lots of caterpillars and these little bluebirds here, you might have only a handful of tertiary consumers in this whole ecosystem because there's not enough energy. And so the biomass of tertiary consumers is going to be much smaller than the biomass of the producers. And again, this can be represented by this rule of 10%. And then lastly is the numbers pyramid, which kind of just goes with what you would think if there's much less energy at the top, there's going to be much fewer organisms. So look at this here. We might have hundreds and thousands of trees at the bottom. Well, every tree, every tree doesn't have a giraffe eating it because there, there's not enough energy. And so there's going to be less giraffes than there are trees. Well, if there was one lion for every giraffe out there, we would run out of giraffes really quickly. And so there's a lot fewer lions then there are giraffes and so again these are these this is kind of the rule of 10 percent so we're going to continue to lose 90 percent we're only going to have 10 percent left over for each successive trophic level and so we had three different pyramids energy which kind of encompasses all of it then biomass and then lastly this numbers pyramid